this morning, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me to uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. Uh, as of the last I heard, our government is getting ready to default. How many people have heard that? And there's a lot of fear. I've talked, uh, Pastor Harold and I go down to the high rise and a lot of the folks down there, they're afraid that they're not going to get their, their social security check. They're not going to get, you know, their benefits because the government is getting ready to go bankrupt. How many, now, now don't put your hands up. How many here have ever got into hot water with money? I'll put mine up. It's not hard to do, is it? In a society whose economy is based on debt, it's not hard to do. They give you that little piece of plastic, and you can just go out and buy whatever you want. Boom. And my experience has been that most of the time, not all the time, because sometimes things can happen, you know, and you can know, have catastrophes and so forth. But most of the time, when people get in hot water with money, and maybe you, if you want to disagree with me, you can, but it's usually because we try to get stuff we don't need with money we don't have. Why is our nation in this p position? Because we've been governed by people, and I'm not just talking about the current administration. We've been governed by people that tried to get a whole lot of stuff they didn't need with money they didn't have. Same thing, just on a bigger scale. And we're talking decades of this stuff going on. So I don't want, I'm not talking Democrat, Republican, or any. This goes back, you know, a long time. And I found out that, and I'm saying this, I'm not just being a naysayer, I'm not just being a, you know, a doomsday guy. But, by and large, the people that run our government, I think, are not on the up and up. <laughs> Is that a nice way to put it? Now, now I, I really believe this, that most people that enter into public service I believe they enter in, most of them, with the a, with a, with a right intention. I do. It's just like ministry. Most people that get into ministry start off with a good intention, but we all know what happens sometimes there, huh? And, and what it boils down to is the aspect of power. Power. The ability... To exercise your will over somebody else. And indeed, those, you know, the Bible says that those who are in leadership, or they don't, maybe they don't realize it, but that actually, actually is a ministry uh, appointed by God to be, you know, to keep the peace and to defend the nation. That's what government, human government is supposed to be for. We've changed that. I want you to read with me in Luke chapter 12, because this morning... We want to talk about fear. Because what is happening when people operate, people in leadership operate without an understanding of their responsibility to a creator, they do things that generate fear. Now, some fear is good. There's, there's good fear and there's bad fear. You know, if you're walking through the woods and you see a bear, you ought to be afraid of the bear. That's a good fear. But there's some things we don't need to be afraid of. And especially as believers. There's some things that we need to have the courage to stand. Chapter 12, and you know, the last few weeks we've been talking about offering and giving. And it really ties all in with that. Because the reason why most people don't give is they're afraid of losing something. There's fear. Okay, so read with me. Uh, Luke chapter 12. And we'll start with verse 1. In the meantime... When they were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples. Now, if you want to understand about the meantime, if you look back in chapter 11, Jesus had just rebuked the Pharisees for hypocrisy. And he says this in verse 1. Here's, what, here's one thing we need to be afraid of. 
Here's one thing we need to beware of. In this chapter, the words fear and beware and take no thought are used many, many times. Warnings of what to be afraid of and what not to be afraid of. He starts by saying, beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Leaven, of course, if you, know, if you understand the scriptures, leaven means yeast, but you put in bread to make it puffy. And uh, in the Bible, leaven is always a type of sin. Leaven is never meant to be anything good. It always represents sin. And what Jesus said, the leaven of the Pharisees, the Pharisees were the leaders. They were like, uh, at that time, uh, I always like to say this in case somebody doesn't understand this. At that time, there were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they were the, the, not only the religious leaders, but also the civil leaders of, of, the, of the Israelites. And the Pharisees were like the Republicans, and the Sadducees were like the Democrats. Because the Pharisees were very conservative and very strict, and they had a very uh, strict understanding of Scripture. And the Sadducees were the real liberal, okay? And so they were like two different parties. And there were more Pharisees and Sadducees, but the Sadducees had the high priest, okay? So it sounds familiar, that, okay? <laughs> it's... it's you know, but, but this, was, this was the leadership of Israel. Well, the Pharisees were the ones, the, the leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, were the ones that opposed Jesus the most. Because they realized that his coming, he represented himself as the Messiah, but he wasn't the Messiah that the Pharisees wanted. They were looking for another kind of Messiah, okay? So they always tried to, they always tried to uh, trap him in his own words. They tried to corner him. They always found ways to try to uh, denounce him. And, and degrade him and degrade his ministry and so forth. So that's in, in chapter 11, that's what, 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 is, what is going on. And he says here, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, how many people have heard this statement? When you ask, go to somebody and say, hey, why don't you come, why don't you come to my church? He says, there's too many hypocrites in church. How many have ever heard that? Well, you know, there's hypocrites everywhere. There, there, any place I ever went, I, there was somebody there... The word hypocrite, hypocrisy, means uh, it, it, like play acting. And the word is actually comes from, and I've, I've said this before, some of you know this, that, that if you ever saw a picture of like the two masks, a smiling mask and a, and a, and a, and a sad mask, and in the Greek theater, in, 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 his, in the, these days they had theater, one person might play do two different roles. And they would put the mask on when they were playing one particular role, they would put that mask on, and then they would change masks, and they would be like another, another role. And the word for hypocrite or hypocrisy comes from the word that, that meant that mask. And what hypocrisy is, is putting masks on, uh, being something different to different people. Now, Paul tells us that we do need to be able to relate to other people. So to the Jew, I became as a Jew. To the Greek, I became as a Greek. We need to be able to relate ourselves to other people. That doesn't mean we have to be phony. Hypocrisy means being a phony. It means being one thing with her and a different thing with him and a different thing. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be what she wants me to be and I'll be what she wants me to be when I'm with her. And just, just, just so I can, I can garner friendship and influence. So Jesus warns us. He says, be, fear this. He says, fear the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Christians, listen. We need to be sincere believers. We need to be sincere. You don't have to put on a show for anybody. Be yourself in Christ. Be yourself in Christ. He says, For there is nothing covered, in verse 2, that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which... You have spoken in the ear, in the closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. He's saying that these hypocrites, these Pharisees who were in charge of things, all they were interested in is their power base. And it's pretty much the same thing with the government of the United States of America. It's not about caring for the welfare of the people of the United States. It's about who, who's going to vote for me in 2012. It's about who am I going to impress? Who's going to be on my side? What are the analysts going to say about me? That's what politics is about anymore. It's about power. It's about maintaining your power base. It's hypocrisy. That's why they stand up and say, I'm, I'm a patriot and I'm for America. They're really only for themselves. They might have started out that way. 
And there might be a few like that. But I, I have to believe, maybe I'm being cynical, but I have to believe they're few and far between. See, we need to be afraid of hypocrisy. We're, our nation is reeling right now for people who have led it over the last decades who have been hypocrites. I can remember my first, you know, I guess I'll give my age away, my first uh, consciousness of leadership in the nation. You know, little kids don't understand when you talk, they don't understand about it. But the first, when I really first became conscious of that was on November 22nd, 1963. How many people know what that day was? That's the day when President Kennedy got shot. That was also my birthday. <laughs> so it was kind of like, you know, I was 10 years old. I'm giving my age away. I was 10 years old. And, and I, I just, I, I, I started hearing about this, you know, President Kennedy. And I knew about Paul, I mean, I knew there was a president and so forth. I learned all that. But going through the 60s and 70s, oh my goodness, the Vietnam War, Watergate, blah, blah, blah. You know, one thing after another after another. And it wasn't just one party or another. It was just, they, they all, you know, you begin to think they're all a bunch of crooks. I am not a crook. I may remember that. <laughs> okay. Some of you are old enough to remember that, right? Uh, and, Hypocrisy. He says, be afraid of hypocrisy. But look what he says in verse 4. I said, we're, we're going to go what you should be afraid of and what you shouldn't be afraid of. Verse 4. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. People are wringing their hands because of what's going on in this country right now. You know what? We don't have to be afraid of what they're going to do in Washington. We don't have to be afraid of what happens if the government shuts down. We don't have to be afraid of what happens if the interest rates go up. We don't have to be afraid because we have a God who can provide all our needs according to His riches and glory. We don't have to be afraid. My Bible says perfect love casts out fear. See, if I'm tied in with Christ, yeah, I, I hear all this stuff going on. And I'm thinking, I'm praying, I'm praying for our leadership. But you know what? God is in control. He says, don't be afraid of them that can kill the body. And he was talking to men who in just a few decades would, have, would be martyred for their faith. He's equipping them. See, we don't understand that about somebody's going to kill my body for my faith. We don't, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't equate with us. But he says, don't be afraid of them that kill the body and can have no more that they can do. But I'll warn you, I'll tell you who you ought to be afraid of. Don't be afraid of who's sitting down in Washington. Be afraid of the one sitting on the throne. Amen. And somebody said, well, that's not really fear. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, you know what? I, I, I want to respect God. I love him. He's Abba Father. I love him. He's my, he's, my, he's my daddy and all that. But you know what? He's God. You need to be afraid of the God that can send you to hell. Listen to what he says. He says, I'll forewarn you who you shall fear. Fear him which, after he has killed, has power to cast you into hell. For I say unto you, fear him. We need to understand that we serve a powerful, awesome, holy God. We treat Him like our buddy. We treat Him like, but He's holy. He wants to be our friend. Jesus is our friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. Great song. But He's holy. We need to never lose that healthy, honest, respect, respectful fear of the God who could snap His fingers and end the universe if He wanted to. Because that's how it came into existence. He spoke the word. If he spoke the word and brought it in, he could speak the word and send it out. Listen to what he says. Verse 6. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? If God knows what's going on with the birds, he says, even the very hairs of your head are numbered. My number's going down. <laughs> okay. But he has them numbered. He knows everything about me. He says, even the very hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Because you're, you're worth more than any sparrow. Don't be afraid of what's going on. If you're his child, if you belong to him, if your faith is in him for your salvation, you can have faith in him for your stuff. You can have faith in him to meet all your needs. Sometimes it looks scary. Sometimes we get to, you know, one minute before midnight. But God will be there. He's promised He would be there. He might not be there with what we want Him to be there with, but He's going to be there, and He's going to make sure that you're not going to suffer under the hands of those 
who are making decisions for us. He'll provide our needs. If he feeds the sparrows, in another place Jesus was preaching in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, look at the flowers of the field. Look how beautiful they are. You're worried about how you're dressed? You'll have clothes on your back. You'll have food in your stomach. You'll have a place to live. Trust in God. He says this. Now. Verse 8. Also I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before the Son of Man, or before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. Don't be afraid of your testimony. Don't be afraid to share your testimony. Don't be afraid to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. My friend Judge Maggio preached a message one time, 17 reasons why people don't witness. <laughs> now we'll find all kinds of reasons why, well, I'm too busy. I, uh, don't be afraid. To share your faith in Jesus Christ. You might be rejected. You might be laughed at. You might be scoffed. Well, okay. But don't be afraid. In fact, we need to understand that if we don't share our testimony, if we refuse to share our faith in Christ, it says right here, but he that denies me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. That's a... That's a heavy statement. That's a heavy statement. If we deny that we know Christ, you mean he's going to deny that he knows us? This is some heavy stuff here. See, I want Jesus to be able to confess. And when I stand before him, I want him to be able to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I want him to be able to confess before all the angels that here was one who heard my voice and did what I told him to do. I want to be able to say, I'm glad I did instead of I wish I would have. We need to be afraid of not sharing our testimony. We need to not be afraid of sharing our testimony. Listen, how many people, I've, now, again, you don't have to put your hands up. I want to ask you this question. How many of you have shared your faith with somebody this week? Even if it was laying a track on a, on a table in a restaurant. Even if it was just, you know, putting a track somewhere that somebody could pick up. How many people? Wouldn't it be something that everybody in the body of Christ would go out and tell at least one or two people a week about Jesus? No, you're bound to, you're bound to, you're bound to attract somebody to the, to the faith. We as a church, especially the way things are going on right now in this nation, we need to be, we need to be all about sharing our faith. Because there's a lot of people who are scared. There's a lot of people who are hurting. There's a lot of people who, who don't know what the future holds. We know what the future holds because the Word tells us. And we need to have our feet anchored on the rock that is Christ. Reading on a little bit more. Look at verse 10. This is something we need to be afraid of. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemes against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. We need to be afraid of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Somebody says, what's that? Well, this is a big question. Blasphemy. What does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Ghost? Before I was saved, I used to make fun of people that talked in tongues. That's not what it means. When, when you read this and you put it in context in, in another gospel, it talks about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. The the Pharisees were ascribing the works of Jesus to the devil. Okay? When they saw Jesus casting out demons, they said, well, he's casting out demons by the power of Satan, by the power of Beelzebub. And Jesus warned them about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? When we see God doing something and we know it's God, and we purposely ascribe that to the devil, when we purposely turn our back on what we know is the Lord, it's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Somebody might be sitting in here today and say, Oh, I wonder if I ever blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Listen, if you're worried about it, you haven't. See, I'm not, that's a big teaching about this. You know, we're not going to go on to, off on a tangent. But see, when you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, it means when you turn from what you know is true, and if that happens, God will give you over to a reprobate mind. If you even care, you haven't done it yet. If you care what God thinks, you haven't blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Thank God. <laughs> If you're convicted, I've had somebody t tell me one time, you know, they didn't want to go to church because they were all convicted. I said, that's when you need to go to church. Thank God you're convicted. If you wasn't convicted, I'd be worried about you. 
See, what, what happens when, when, we, when, we, when we refuse to hear God's voice, our heart gets a little hard. Gets a little hard. Get a little callous. And, and the first time when you refuse to hear God's voice, it, it's really tough. It's just, oh, man. But the second time, it's a little easier. And the next time, and, you, and next time you find, eventually you'll find yourself with a seared conscience. And that's when you come, that's where the danger is of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, of going beyond, beyond the line where you could be saved again. See, I'm speaking to those who are in Christ. Do not quench the Spirit of God. If God is putting conviction on you, you listen to it. Get on your knees and ask forgiveness. Get on your knees and get to the cross and get under the blood of Jesus and get restored. Don't shut God up. Okay. Okay. You need to be afraid of that. Listen to what else he says. Look at verse 11. Here's something that we don't need to be afraid of. And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in that same hour what you ought to say. When, when we, I, don't, I don't think any of us have ever experienced official persecution. We've been rejected by loved ones. We've had people maybe make fun of us or reject what, we, what, we've had to, what we've had to say. But he's talking here to individuals that in just a few years would be persecuted. Officially, they'd be thrown in jail. They'd be taken before the magistrates. They'd be taken before uh, 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 governors and so forth to defend their faith. And, you know, that would be pretty scary if they'd march you in front of, you know, the Supreme Court to defend your faith. It'd be, you know, them guys sitting up there would be pretty scary. Jesus says, don't be afraid of sharing your faith. Don't be afraid of what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit, when you get in a position where you have to defend your faith or where you have to present your faith, the Holy Spirit will give you what to say. That doesn't mean we shouldn't study His Word and so forth. Of course we should. But when we get in that position, we don't have to rehearse. You ever rehearse things? You know, you're going to meet with somebody and you have it all planned out what you're going to say. Jesus says, don't do that. Don't be afraid. If you have the Holy Spirit dwell inside of you, He'll give you what to say. He'll give you the words to say. Just be, just be reliant upon Him. Don't be afraid of that. Now, we come to the good part. The part about stuff. Okay. And one of the companies said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Jesus, will you please go talk to my brother? He got all the inheritance. He ain't giving me none. Anybody ever been in that situation? He's ripping me off. It ain't fair. He's taking it all for himself. Not giving me anything. God help us. I say, I hope I, I hope I die with nothing, so nobody fights over. You know. <laughs> we're, get, we're getting. It. <laughs> and Jesus said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? V verse fifteen. And he said unto them, Take heed. Now watch out. Here, beware. He's, he's telling us the things we need to fear. Beware of, you see that word? Covetousness. Wanting what somebody else has. Not feeling complete unless you get what somebody else. Not, not being happy, not being content with what you got, but I want. My neighbor got one, and I want one. My, my, my uncle got one, and I, I want one. My cousin got one, and I want covetousness. I got to have more. 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 So watch out for that. That's deadly. That's something we need to be afraid of. That's something we need to plug into our minds and say, well, I don't want to go there. He says, take heed and beware of covetousness. Why? For a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And he told this parable, and we've read this parable before and heard it. The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, verse 17, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow my fruits and goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Well, he hit the good life. Hit the jackpot. He made it. Made it the ladder of success. The American dream, right? Sit back in a, you know, 
$600,000 house with three car garage and swimming pool and, you know, cool, I've, I've got, I'm, I'm here. But God said unto him, he, had his, he was kicking his feet up and he was just so proud of himself because everything went so well. He had everything that he wanted, at least for the time being. But God said unto him, you fool, this night your soul shall be required of you. Then whose those th things uh, be which thou hast provided? So is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich to work God. Watch out putting your eyes on earthly treasure instead of the things of God. Be careful of covetousness. It's okay if God blesses you to be able to have stuff. If God prospers you, he gives us the power to get wealth. It tells us in the Old Testament. He gives us the power to, to you know, establish ourselves. And he can bless us in those ways. That's a good thing. But make sure you don't make that your priority. And if you don't get there, don't feel like you're some kind of second-class citizen in the kingdom of God because that stuff really has nothing to do with your relationship with God. But we make it a big thing. Just like this guy did, man. He, he's sitting back. And I'm sure his neighbors probably looked at him and said, man, God's blessing him. Look at that. He has everything he needs. But that fool was laying for himself treasures but didn't lay up anything in the kingdom for himself. You need to be careful. You need, to, you need to fear missing the boat on that, that kind of stuff. Now listen to what he says. Verse 22. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, and he's saying to us, his disciples in 2011 in the United States of America, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for the body what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. How much more are you better than the fowls? If God takes care of the fowls of the air, don't you think He's going to take care of you? Now, now, now I, I want you to understand that the Bible teaches us that it's good to work it's like, behold the ant, you know. And we, and we lay up a store for ourselves. Okay, see, there's, we need to understand the balance here. It doesn't mean we should just go out and lay in the alley and just wait for stuff to happen, okay. God gives us the ability to go and, and earn money and to have a family and, you know, to set some money aside for the rainy day. That's not a bad thing. But when we put all our emphasis on that, when we think more about our 401k than about what this word says, when we get our minds, uh, they begin to stray off the things of God and on the things of the world. Jesus says, don't take no thought. If God can take care of the, of the birds, don't you think he's going to take care of you? If he's giving you a way to make that provision, fine. If not, well, put your faith and trust in him. He's the one that's going to meet the need anyhow, one way or the other. He says, verse 25, And which of you with taking thought can add to a stature one cubit? I can't make myself one inch taller than what I am. If I could, I'd be like seven feet tall and play basketball. <laughs> make a lot of money, but I'm not. If you then be not able to do what, what is least, why take thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, he says, how they grow. They toil not, nor spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothe the grass which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will, you be, will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? Don't be afraid of, what's, of, of losing your stuff. Because he'll give you everything you need. Seek not what you shall eat, nor what you shall drink, neither be of, ye, uh, of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knows that you have need of these things. And here we come, and this is really where I, I read all that, just to get here at verse 31. But rather, he said this in Matthew chapter 7, rather, seek ye first the kingdom of God. See, here's the bottom line. God can bless you with stuff. Maybe you don't have stuff. God can bless you with a lot of wealth. Maybe you don't have that much wealth. It doesn't matter. What you need to be doing, whether you're wealthy or not so wealthy, no matter what you have or don't have, you need to be seeking first the kingdom. 
God, thy kingdom done in earth as it is in heaven. That needs to be our prayer. All this other stuff is really just distractions. This thing going on right now in our government with the debt ceiling and all this and interest rates are going up. Just a distraction. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these things. If you seek his kingdom first, he'll take care of the rest. And I read all that to read this verse 32. Fear not, little flock. Fear not. Pick up the newspaper and read what's going on. Fear not. Read what's going on in the Arab world. Don't be afraid. Read what's going on in Washington, D.C. Don't be afraid. Read what's going on in the mill. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. If you're a child of God, if you're not a child of God, well, then you're kind of on your own. But if you're a child of God, if, your faith in, if you have been to the cross, if you have put your faith and trust in the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you've been to the cross, and you know that God is your Father, you don't have to be afraid of what anybody does. If somebody comes and points a gun at your head, you don't have to be afraid. Why? Because your, your life is in His hand. The Apostle Paul said, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. See, we win no matter what. If, if, if somebody ends our life, the one who gave us life will give us eternal life. We don't have to be afraid. If, if, if you lose your pension, the one that owns the cattle on a thousand hills will meet your need. If you lose your insurance, the one who, uh, the, the, who took upon his, the stripes on his back for my healing, he'll take care of me. That's what it's all about. See, and it's easy to say those things. Until it happens. Isn't that right? It'd be easy for me. Somebody sitting out there thinking right now, well, you don't know what I'm going through. Well, you don't know what I'm going through. <laughs> We're all going through something. Anybody here not going through something? I'll have, you can come up and preach. We're all going through something. But God is good. He's good all the time. He says, Jesus said, to his, to his little band of disciples. He said, fear not, little flock. Why? For it's your Father's good pleasure. He wants to give you the kingdom. It's His pleasure. It's His joy to manifest His kingdom in your life. So our problem is, our idea of what kingdom should be is different than His. But God, manifest your kingdom. It's his pleasure. It's his desire. In fact, I, I believe the word tells us that when, when, when he shows all the angels, uh, the, the saved, the redeemed, the elect, the body of Christ, he like brags on us. Because of his grace and his mercy, he saved us. He holds us up as trophies to all of creation. It's His good pleasure. He wants to bless us. He wants to give us the kingdom. He wants the world to see Christ in us. And when we share our faith, and when we share our testimony, God just gets the glory. He loves it. He says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Then he goes and he tells him, he says, sell what you have. Well, <laughs> wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. You're getting a little too, sorry, a little too crazy here, Jesus. But. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags in which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that fails not, where no thief approaches nor moth corrupts. We ought to be laying our, for ourselves up treasures in heaven. Yeah, we got our 401ks and our retirement. That's fine. But what we really ought to be concerned about is what we're laying up up there. Because the stuff I'm laying up down here, you know what? It's going to fade away. Moth and rust corrupts it. Thieves steal it. Especially around here. <laughs> <laughs> Can't leave nothing laying out around here. Somebody will swipe it right up. But when I lay up in heaven, you know what? Nobody can touch it. Nobody can lay a hand on it. 
It will never get rusty. The, the, the things that I do down here, the, 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 the eternal legacy that I leave here of sharing my faith, and this goes for every one of us, the eternal legacy that we leave here, nobody can touch it. It won't get rusty. The moths won't eat at it. It won't fall apart. You don't have to treat it. You don't have to do anything for it. It's there forever. It's in the, it's in the presence of God. It's gold and silver and precious uh, jewels that will, will never be corrupted. Jesus says, if you focus on that, you don't have to be afraid of anything that this world is going to do to you. If you're focused on what you do for Christ, all these other distractions, that's just what they'll be. They'll be things off to the side. We're blessed that we live in a nation where we have freedom. We're blessed that we live in a nation where we can come to church on Sunday morning and shout and have a great time. You know, there's, most Christians in the world can't do that. There's more martyrs on the face of the earth today than there ever has been. We don't know. We're isolated from it. But there's people in the world today that suffer for their faith more than there was in the first century. They're, they're, they're all over the world where the people suffer. But you know, you know what keeps them going? Those places, in those places, the, the, the church is growing faster than it's ever grown. You know why? Because they're seeking first the kingdom of God. And he's taking care of the rest of it. Read just a little bit more and then we're going to close. He says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where, where's your heart? Where's your heart today? What, what's, what's important to you today? I, I used to, I used to uh, get on the internet and check out my, my 401k, how well it was doing. I got distracted. Every day I'd get on there, you know, ATI benefits. Mm. And if it goes down so low, I'm going to do this more. I spent more time doing that instead of doing what God wants me to do. I had, I had to lay that aside. Put him in charge of that. This is what he says. And what we were talking about. You know, Christ coming back. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves, verse 36, like unto men that wait for their Lord. Are you waiting for God? When he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open unto him immediately. Oh, we could go through a big long thing about the Hebrew wedding customs. When the groom would come for his bride. He wouldn't announce it. He would just come. When he wasn't expected. She knew he was coming, but she didn't, know what, what, she didn't know the day or the hour. She didn't know when. But she knew he was coming. See, we're sitting here today and we're waiting anxiously. Christians all over this world are waiting anxiously for the return of Jesus Christ. We don't know when he's coming, but we know he's coming. And we need to be ready. We need to have our loins girded. That means we need to be ready to travel. We need to have our lights burning. We need to be ready for the time when Jesus is coming back. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when He comes, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that He shall gird Himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Listen. I need to be afraid that I'm not watching. I don't need to be afraid about the, the money or the car. I need to be afraid that I allow myself to get so distracted that I stop watching for His coming. I need to be afraid that I get so distracted that I'm not concerned about what Jesus wants anymore. That's what I need to be afraid of. That's what I need to fear. I never want to get to that place where I, I get into that, that lukewarm. You know, you know what it says in Revelation? You know what it says in Revelation? There's a fellow named Francis Chan. He preached a message called Lukewarm and Loving It. How many people sitting in churches are lukewarm and they really have no desire? Comfortable. I feel comfortable. God, help me never get comfortable with the status quo. Help me never get comfortable with just going through the motions, with doing the church thing, with doing the religion thing. Help me never get comfortable. See, I can, you can get there. I've been there a few times. I've been there a few times where I've got in the rut. Where I was just going through the motions. Preaching the message. Go to church on Sunday. Preach a message. You know, play the music. Do the worship. Every, you know, go, go through, you know. 
And we lose sight of the fact that God didn't call us to just come in here and have church on Sunday. It's part of it. He said, assemble yourselves together. Very important. But he called us to go out there. He called us to lay up treasure in heaven. How? By witnessing, by reaching out to the lost, by praying, by seeking his face, by asking God to move and breathe upon us as individuals in the congregation, by seeking the Holy Spirit to come down and fill us up, oh God, fill us up again, Father, to overflowing. Father, baptize us in the Holy Spirit to overflowing in the name of Jesus. That's what we need to be laying up. That's, that needs to be our priority. The things of God, not the things of man. If we make that our priority, you know what? You won't be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. If you focus on what God wants, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to worry about if the check's going to come. Doesn't matter. God knows what you need. He knows what you need. I want to pray this morning. We're going to close. I thank the Lord. I want to say this. I want to say this. This month, we've spent like a lot of money. And this isn't, I'm not making this a business thing. We spent a lot of money on the steps and we got a carpet and everything. I want to thank the Lord for you, for your faithfulness. Because I expected us to really be in red ink this month. You know what? We're not. We're not. And I thank God for your faithfulness. Because you've been obedient to God. And I, I didn't have to stand up here and say, hey, we need so much of this or that and that. God spoke to you and you, were, you listened to him. I thank God for that. Thank God for you. But see, I pray and I, I, I just want to believe God that I want, to get, I want to get more radical for Christ. I want to have a church full of crazy Christians. I always like crazy stuff anyhow. I want to pray that our focus would be that we would be radically saved. Our focus would be on Christ. That if we even begin, and I pray this for myself, that if we even, if we even begin to get a little lukewarm, that the Holy Spirit will come down and shake us around. Stop it. The light of fire underneath us. I pray that my heart would not be hardened. I pray that my spirit, that God's spirit in me would not be quenched. I pray that my conscience would not be seared through complacency. My prayer for me, my prayer for you. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, we're, we're humans. We're human beings. That are very, we're like, we're like sheep. We're very easily distracted. It's very easy for us to, to get our eyes off of you and put them on things that might even look a little bit like you. And it's very easy for us, just like, just like those sheep, they say sheep can be dumb and they just wander off. Father, we can wander off at the drop of a hat. My prayer is this morning, Lord, as you have, as we've seen in your word, there are some things we need to fear, but Father, there are some things that we don't need to fear. We need to fear hypocrisy. We need to fear covetousness. We need to fear complacency. But Father, we don't need to fear what your will is for us. And if we seek your will, if we seek the kingdom of God, we don't have to be afraid of what man can do to us. We don't have to be afraid of what the government's going to do. We don't, have to, we don't have to live our lives in fear. But we can live our lives in confidence knowing that you are in control. Father, my prayer is for those in this room this morning. There might be some that know you as their Savior. There might be some that don't know you as their Savior. 
If there's any in here this morning, Father, that have never called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they may be here this morning because, because they're afraid. They don't know, they're confused. They don't know what's going on. Father, there's no, you are not the author of confusion. There can be no confusion of what's happening in the world today. Your word is very, very clear. That as man turns his back on you, as sin abounds, the love of many will wax cold. It's not confusion. Perhaps there's somebody that came here today and they say, I, I, I got to know what's going on. Father, I pray if there's anybody in this room that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, Father, you would speak to their heart right now and say, you need to go up there after that church is over and you need to talk to that pastor or talk to his wife or talk to one of the brothers to pray with you to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to somebody's heart this morning. Father, I pray if there's somebody in here that knows you, that is saved, that does call you their father, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to that one and encourage that one and assure that one as being a child of God, they have no need of being afraid. Father, I pray that you would minister your Holy Spirit. Father, if there's somebody in this room this morning that says, you know, I need, I need more of God. I pray, Lord, if there's anybody in this room that does not, has not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Father, they would cry out this moment and say, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. It's you, overflowing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, you know, if, if you need prayer, I was going to, just going to hit close and say, come up after, but you know what? If you need prayer, won't you come? For anything, for anything. If you need prayer, won't you come? Won't you come? You can tell me what it is. You don't have to tell me what it is. We'll just pray. If you need prayer, won't you come? Won't you come?